All right, so we had um, three points of inquiry on the table for your breakout rooms. Um, what was your analysis of the reading? Um, what is the critique that AAMT has of CRT? And finally, what stood out to you most about African-American male theory? Uh, who would like to share? I'll share. Okay. Do I just select which question? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I'll do my analysis of the reading, which was basic. Oh, I'm sorry, the AAMT's crit, uh, critique of the critical race theory mm -hmm. is basically saying that the critical race theory is a limitation um, to Black men because the standard is a white man masculinity. Like it has to go back. It doesn't um, know the perspective, the pre and post, um, uh, what is it? Personal experiences from that other than to go back like the masculinity. And an example said that the calmness that black men know is from being around a white man instead of saying, oh, you know, they developed it themselves. It's always going back to a white man. It's not particularly, oh, the black man has developed this because he was taught this way. It's always the standard that limits the black man from having their own regulations and rules instead of going to another race that they're not. So that was the critique that we had discussed mostly about um, the critical race theory. Thank you, Sheree. Uh, who else <laughs> like to share? Um, I would like to share. Okay. Um, adding on to um, remind me how to pronounce your name again. It's Sheree. Sheree. Um, uh -huh. I was telling my um, my breakout room that when I was in high school and I asked them like, were you guys taught the critical race theory? And they said no. So when I was taught the critical race theory, it was the most craziness. At the time, I didn't like put much of attention to it. But when I was reading the 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 article, it told me like damn, they were literally belittling us because we literally got taught the critical race theory with pretty much little kid books. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss books. And it was like, wow, we're at a high school level. I'm pretty much smart enough to read at my level. So why are you like giving us this? And so at that time, I was like, wow, this is really about like I'm learning something. But when I went into um, college and I started learning more and like feeding my brain, um, it was pretty fucked up the way like they made they, they glorified this, this theory. I think also, Liz, we, we, I'm picking up from what you're saying, what you're saying. Um, so within the article, right, they talk about critical race theory and they also talk about this thing called deficit model approaching approaches to schooling and it's not very explicit in the way it's talked about it's very implicit it's very undergirded in the in the reading but this deficit model of, of schooling is assuming the worst in your students right so instead of assuming that you guys could read college level material i'm going to provide you high school level material and from what i heard from liz although they were doing critical race work it was done with a deficit model approach because they're not going to give them high school level material to engage critical race theory with. They gave them Dr. Seuss books. So while I'm speaking to your cultural nuances, I'm also not speaking to your intellectual capabilities because I'm going to give you ch ch children's books, right? Um, very good point. Let's get one more before we move on. I also want to um, backtrack what Liz said too because um, when I got taught critical race theory, it was by, a, um, I had a white teacher and basically everything that was taught to me was taught by a white men that um, just basically how I felt and how a lot of other people felt. Because when I was in school, I, it wasn't a lot of black kids in my class. I didn't have a lot of black students. It was probably like me and two other black kids. So it basically every time we talked about that, it felt like we were getting singled out and like basically like, you know, experiencing the same thing, not like it does that same thing, but like almost to the fact experiencing that type of um, thing all over again. So it like, it just made us felt like a certain, like, a certain way. So um, yeah, so I honestly, I wholeheartedly agree with that. It was bad. 
Yeah, and, and just looking at the, the chat, right? Liz said her teacher was white also. So I, I think it's something, um, to LJ's point, right, this controlling of the narrative becomes important. And, and I think it's something that seems almost disingenuous when it comes from the mouth of the oppressor for, for, um, for colloquialism um, that kind of causes students of culture not to take that on with the best of intentions, right? Yeah, and then a lot of stuff that I have to learn about my history, I got taught by white, white teachers. Yeah. I didn't get the full scope of my history. So I had to teach myself. And um, it was difficult because it was like, you gotta go to, you go to school to learn, you don't learn what you need to learn. Yeah. So it was very unfortunate because it was like, why am I here? Like, why am I in this classroom? Why are you teaching me? Why are we here? And it's like, you're the reason. And it was, it was hard. So I had to, I was in school to learn, went home and I had to learn, I had to learn. I had to learn about Martin Luther King, uh, Rosa Parks and all them, um, and all the people that helped us and rebuilt our history and took back like our power. So it was, it was kind of weird growing up and going to school like that. And still right now to this day, cause we don't get a lot of um, African-American teachers teaching history to us. I, that didn't happen until college. Like that's when I started seeing like a lot of black teachers. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I think what you're pointing to, Lanisha, is the distinction between education and schooling. So what you said, right, without using this terminology is, I went to school and I was socialized to, to learn what they taught me. Then I went home and I had to educate myself. Uh, Liz, yeah. did you have your hand up? Yes, um, I was gonna add on something where um, in this, um, in my other, in my psychology class, my abnormal psychology class, uh, my professor, she's um she's she's black but she's on hardcore shit but it's so cool that she just expresses what she feels and she told me this thing that stood out to me um a lot where she said we don't get she was referring to herself like we don't teach black history because we don't want to hurt white kids um um white white kids feelings and it's true because once you start hearing about the things that are glorified by white men is like, this has been done by black men long, long, like way longer than they have. Yeah, very good point. Well, I'm gonna tell y'all, I don't give a damn about hurting no white kids feelings. Um, I'm gonna just tell the truth as it's supposed to be told because my primary objective is the truth, right? That's just how, how I move and if some people's feelings get hurt, so be it. Because they never give a damn about our feelings when it comes to these educational spaces. And I don't think Lanisha's um, feelings were spared when she got the, went through her experience. I don't think Liz's feelings were spared, were spared when they went through her experience. So I don't, I don't have time for that, nor do I have any sympathy for white tears. Um, Armani? Um, like Liz said, I actually saw an article um, about parents. Well, I guess schools are trying to implement critical race theory, but parents are really mad and adamant that they don't because they don't want their kids to learn about the crazy history that we've endured. And I just think it's just really sad that people are scared for their kids to learn about the truth. And it's just really unfortunate. And that just shows the level where we are in our country. Yep, we're not as progressive as we thought we were. Uh, Destiny? Um, going back on what Liz had said, I just think it's really funny how it goes into play with white fragility. like. You can't tell white people their history, but you have no problem telling black people about enslavement. You know what I mean? Like, I just, it's just so funny. And like telling like this side of history, the only good side about white people and how they were so innovative. Like it just, it could also go into play with like um, white supremacy and making them think that they're so smart, you know, and they were able to create all these things, but it's just like, they're being misinformed if that makes any sense. So true. Um, so just go ahead, Liz. You got a question? It, and it's so crazy that yeah. we don't think much of it when these things were occurring. But once we get educated on, like, no, why do you feel less if you're this type of skin color? No, why do you feel less if you come from here or there? But at that time, we're belittled by someone that society glorifies so much for so many years. And we read about them, we learn about them. But I also didn't learn much about my culture through high school. I barely started learning in college because it was my choice to learn. It was my tuition money that I had to pay. 
in order for me to get taught what has happened in my culture. And it took me the initiative to learn about someone else's culture, which is very fascinating to me. Uh, Liz, who is your um, who is your psychology teacher? Oh, damn. Libby Lewis, possibly. Um, Miss Almanza. Almanza. Okay, I'm not. I'm not. Professor familiar. Almanza. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Alexandra. Yeah, yeah, Liz kind of went over what I was just about to say, but I was going to say is that uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, you have to go out and seek this information. And it makes me think that, you know, the people that do take these classes are obviously they're interested in seeking them, but the people that need to be taking these classes aren't taking them. And it's and that information that should be given to you in required schooling, it's a loss and it's a miss. And now we're here and we're probably, you know, people that are interested in taking this, but the again, the people that need to be taking this class aren't, and that's such a like disservice. You know, I agree with you, Alexandria, but then also kind of push back on that notion because here's here's another thing too, and, and we'll go to Sharif. Um, like, if you were to force these personalities into these courses, right, I would have to deal with a whole bunch of bullshit that I wouldn't want to have to deal with, right? is going to devalue your experience in the course because in time instead of me being attentive to you all i'm having to put out the fires from disgruntled individuals right and and, and also we need to learn about ourselves like liz said i didn't learn about my own culture till i got to college right so right. so the way that i think about it the people who need to be in these courses and who the people who i would prefer to have in these courses are the people who are the subject matter of the course Right. right, but I'm saying in like in like I, I know what you're saying. Know, I got you. Go ahead. Elementary, middle school, all that stuff yeah. is part of requirement. Yeah, um, if it was like um, initiated into the core fabric of all educational experiences, then it would be be able. Exactly. To, yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, so we have Cherie, Lanisha, LJ, and then we'll move on to my notes. I I I kind of have somewhat of a different experience because I went to school in a predominantly black neighborhood and it was mostly black kids. So, so as far as like being black history, it was always like um, an African teacher coming from some place to teach us about our history and dress up in the customary, you know, traditional outfits and stuff. But the, the thing is, it was more so watered down after that. It was more so like, oh, who invented the light bulb? Everyone knows Thomas Edison, but however, the thing that makes the light bulb actually glow, a black man did it. So it's just like everything is covered or masticated in like the ideology of like a white man did this, but you, just like the article said, dig deeper. How did he create this? Oh, a black man, a black man did this. He did it, you know, like these other people like street lights and stuff. And then I didn't even know about mulatto and took until I had a Pan-African study here on campus like pre-COVID and stuff like that. I didn't even know the term mulatto until I went there. I didn't know that these things were being created by black men until I came to college, like you guys said. But even though I was taught trinkets of here and then being African descent of Ethiopian, like my family is like heavily enriched in that. So I, I learned that way. But as far as like our history, like I've learned since I've got to college. Good point. Thank you, Sheree. Uh, Lanisha? Yeah, I wanted to backtrack that because I agree with that too about the Black History Month and the celebration in school. Um, but also that my parents learned the same thing I learned. Then my sisters and my oldest brothers learned the same thing that I learned. We learned from white people. They didn't take that information and go outside of school to learn more. I had to. I did. So I couldn't get taught by my parents about our history because they didn't take that step to educate themselves further and be like, let's think about this. So I had to take a different route than they did. My sisters and brothers did the same thing. They didn't go outside of school getting taught by white people and go outside of school and further the education about certain things. There were certain things um, about our, our history that I did not know. I had to research and it was spent a certain way that it was a, it was a lie, it was a lie. They spent a lot about it. And, and just what she said about Tom, um, Thomas Edison and light bulb and who invented it to help him get to a certain point. Black, There's a lot of information about Black people inventing things that got 
whitewash for white people. Yeah. They invented a certain thing. The white people came and they took over and they did something that, um, it, well, white people did something and the black people innovated it and made it um, more of a useful thing. And it got, it just got whitewashed. So a lot of things, it was a lot of things going on during that time. It's still right now. Yeah, thank you, Lanisha. Uh, LJ? Yeah, no, nah, listening to the class talk, it just made me think of a story. Um, so I, I remember when I was in high school, um, the teachers, so I went to school in the Valley, San Fernando Valley, and um, I remember uh, my teacher giving the class, so she gave us a class project, right? She wanted all of us to do, you know, like history, like, you know, do, do a report or history on your family history. All right, so I remember thinking like, well, damn, you know, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not privy. I'm not really knowledgeable in my family history. You know, we've been stripped, right? I've been, you know, my family's been stripped of that. And we don't, unfortunately, I don't have like a lineage to kind of fall back on. You know, obviously I'm of African descent, but I don't know what country, what tribe and things of that nature. So I told, so I remember I told her, I said, and after class, I said, well, uh, teacher, um, I don't, I don't even, you know, unfortunately, I you know, I, I don't know my, my family's history. And she was like, well, well what's your last name? She, so I, I told her, Glenn. And she's like, you know what? That's Irish. So you should do a project on Ireland. And so in my mind, right, 16, 17, I'm thinking, oh, I'm Irish, right? So I go with the flow. I'm excited. Oh, I'm Irish. I got something to cling to. So I literally had my dad take me to the, to the library, you know, the big library downtown by USC. And I literally went and got books, man, and studied Ireland. I really, I really did it in Ireland, man. And uh, I just think, I think back like all those years ago, man, I think about how, how like irresponsible that was that, that teacher to do that. I'm not fucking Irish. That's a slave name. You had me, you had, she had me study in a white country and had me like really hyped up and thinking that I had some kind of connection to that, man. So I, I guess I'll say that to say that, um, you know, these teachers, man, especially in, for what it's worth, um, you know, a lot of times white teachers, they, it, look, they, a lot of them is these messages, you know, if it's a controlled narrative, whatever they're doing in these classrooms, it, it's kind of like itself, it, it kind of serves, if it, it has to be self-serving to them and a lot of, in a, in, a, in a sense, because, you know, looking back, man, like that, that was, like, that was fucked up, yeah. you know what I mean? To have me doing that without being like more cognizant of the fact that, you know what I'm saying? May, I should have probably been doing something else. So, but I, I think that just kind of speaks to how these these teachers in these public school spaces with black with black and brown uh, students how they how they operate. So, yeah, I, yeah, that 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 what you experienced, LJ, was psychological and spiritual violence. There's no other way to to think about that. She psychologically, culturally, and spiritually assaulted your being, you know, and and let her tell it. She thought she was doing something good for you. So you know, this way Lauren Hill said the, the the word to hell to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Um, so let's let's jump. Go, go, go ahead, Marquis. The last one, and we'll jump into the notes for a second time. Sorry, yeah, I don't know how to raise my hand like with the things, but um, anyways, I was gonna say that's totally true. I grew up in a predominantly white um space too in Washington, and it was funny because I didn't really realize all of this until I got older about how much I you know, the little microaggressions and the little things that would happen in class. And I would think that's okay. Or, you know, oh, you know, oh, Martin Luther, Marquisha, listen up, or, you know, this is for you or like they're doing something. Right. And then, but the other part of me, it was like, I really did have some good um, teachers that did want me to succeed and stuff like that. So I kind of, it's kind of hard, right? Because it's like, well, they didn't get taught on this stuff. Right. And then the other part of it's like, well, as a teacher, maybe they should, uh, want to try to do this but then again it's like if the whole population is mostly white what do they look like you know going in depth for little marquisha and whoever you're making else, a lot of excuses know? you make a lot of excuses for that marquisha <laughs> see look <laughs> um <laughs> it's coming out huh well i yeah i, I just try to be open-minded but um but I, I, I do recognize it definitely. And I guess it's something I still have to work through with my childhood and upbringing, but I don't know. I just thought I'd like to share that experience. Yeah, and I, I think it's important. And also when you put into context, the distinction between education and schooling, a lot of this makes a lot more sense. So let me get into my notes and we can kind of get to that contextualization. Um, so I, again, I, if y'all know me, you know, I'm very much into like how articles, books, chapters start, right? 
And, and this is very profound, profound because they lay out why they're doing what they're doing very early on in the, in the article, right? He says, there's no uniform theory has emerged as a foundation and frame that explains the lives of African men and boys, right? So there's a gap in research and scholarly um, research as it pertains to black men and black boys experiences and the authors want to fill that void, right? And they let you know that we aspire for a more dynamical lens and theory, borrow literally, and we borrow liberally from the ecological systems theory, which allows for more fluid interactions and juxtapositions of abstract concepts and con abstract and concrete concepts, environments, time periods, and other phenomena. So one, they're saying in response to critical race theory, right? We want to develop a more dynamic theory, right? Something more expansive. Um, and they're going to borrow from ecological systems theory to create this theory, right? So building on and give, providing more than what critical race theory is doing, but also grounding the work in ecological systems theory, right? And they say, thus, their aim is A, summarize developments of, in African-American male studies, B, to discuss the problems the problematics of critical race theory and other attempts at theorizing the lives of African-American boys and men, and C, by building on aspects of ecological theory, provide some basic tenets to help situate and construct a dialogue towards African-American male dia development, position, and practice. Um, so then they talk about the contributions to the school of thought for African-American boys and children, um, and they said that there's initially three major movements that added to this development. And then um, and those first, initial three were the um, women's movement. The second one was the gay liberation movement. And the third one was the men's movement. Again, when you think about the men's movement, you have to think about it like thinking about feminism, right? A predominantly white movement that did not take race into consideration. Um, two more movements were added, the majority movement. And to be honest with you, I don't even know what the majority movement is. Um, but then the, the authors themselves, they add the Black Power and Civil Rights Movement, and then African American Male Studies Movement, African Centered Movement, and then finally hip hop as another movement that allows for the um, investigation and the contemplation of African American um, males' experiences. Um, the author also argues that African American men, um, they have their own definition of manhood and masculinity. Um, it's clustered around self determination, accountability, family, pride, spirituality, humanism, and um, the, and they recognize the duality of the interrelationship of masculine and feminine experiences in both women and men. Right. So they're saying that these black men that were um, studied they recognize that there's both the feminine principles and the masculine principles in both men and women, right? And they, that's something that's vastly different from the way that um, white, project, um, white protagonists of um, this notion of masculinity ide uh, identify with this idea of masculinity. Um, and then it goes on to how this notion of the endangered species really takes root in the um, late 90s, sorry, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and all subsequent academic production has to go inside with this notion of black men being an endangered species, right? Um, one of these um, theorists that take up this charge of black people being endangered species and studying black male um, academic achievement is Agbu and Fordham. And he talks about this idea of acting cool. Right. And this is where this is another one of the critiques that AAMT offers of critical race theory, stating that um, critical race theory situates all of our experiences being a response to white inferiority. Right. And, and, and um, in this case, the cool posture is a posture that is a response to white supremacist and white inferiority um, persecution, when in fact, the article and the authors argue that no. No matter where you go across the globe and you find African people, whether they've been in contact with Europeans or not, they still present this cool posture, right? So some of these things that African people do is um, independent of their experiences with white power structures, right? This is, some of this is just innate in who they are. And this is a part of the critique that they also offer to critical race theory. 
um, using the work of Du Bois, he, he argues that there's a distinct nexus between Africa and America. And he's talking about the Africans on the continent and the African Americans here in, in this part of the hemisphere, which though broken and perverted, is nevertheless not to be neglected by the careful student, right? So if you really want to do work and understanding the life experiences of African people, you cannot ignore Africa, right? And this is the this is coming from the words of Du Bois, who is arguably one of our greatest scholars, right? He says you cannot investigate the life experience of African people without engaging Africa. Um, distinctions are made uh, are necessary across areas and discipline to create specialized programs, pedagogy, and curriculum education. And for me, this becomes extremely important, right? And, and with this also is a response to say that, well, I don't see color. We're all human. We're all the same, right? This is what some of them people will say to let you know that they're not racist, right? I don't see color. We're all, we're all human. They're all human beings, right? These really lofty ideals. But for me, fuck that. We're not all the same, right? There's a cultural specificity that we have as African people. There's a cultural specificity that you have as indigenous people of the Americas. There's a cultural specificity that you have as Asian people. There's a cultural specificity that you have of, as, as Islamic and Arabic people, right? So those specificities become important. And when you start to have this, we're all human approach to education, you have the experiences that we all spent the first half of class talking about. Right? Because to Marquisha's point, well, if the majority of the people are white, why spend time just addressing Marquisha? What you did implicitly, Marquisha, is you devalued your educational experience because the majority does not look like you. And what the article is saying is that distinction that you have as a person becomes important because you should have this pedagogy that speaks to your experience, even if you're the only person in the room, right? And for me as a scholar, as an intellectual, and as a researcher, this becomes extremely important because my goal in my work is to create a pan-African pedagogy to address the life experiences of African people throughout the world, right? Um, African-American male theory asserts that there should be, um, that the study of Africa, I'm sorry, the study of African-American boys and men must be anchored in Africa, again, echoing the words of Du Bois. Um, it talks about this notion of um, resilience theory, which I, I love. Resilience theory is a counter to um, to, to deficit model um, approaches. Again, if you think about what I said earlier in the class about deficit model approaches, that's what Liz experienced, right? While her teacher was trying to do the right thing by presenting a cultural responsive or a critical race theory approach, she still engaged in deficit model thinking by providing her uh, reading material that's below her intellectual level, right? So resilience theory is a counter to that and is concerned with and addresses the ability, capacity, and power that people or systems exhibit that allows them to um, rise above adversity, right? So this is what this idea, this notion of resilience theory is. And in a response to John Ogbu, right, who says that um, black boys are, um, they take, um, Res they take, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they take a revolutionary, they take a, um, a defiant stance against education, right? And, and Agbu tries to equate that um, black boys don't like to achieve educational success because they liken it to being white, right? This is the argument that John Agbu is trying to make. With the author of the article argues that we read that Agbu is conflating schooling and education, right? He's saying that Agbu thinks about what these black students are being defiant against is education, when that's not the case. They're defiant against schooling, right? They're defiant against, and let me pause there, right? So they're being defiant against schooling. So let's talk about how they define schooling and how they define education and the distinction that's being drawn. So Bush, the author of the article, defines schooling as the process used to maintain and continue asymmetrical power relations. Again, 
the process used to maintain and continue asymmetrical power relation. So what schooling will do is keep the people who are in power in power, right? So that's why even when they try to do well-intended things like teaching you critical race theory, they still do it in an underhanded manner because they're not going to allow you to get in a more of a position of power than they are, right? This is what schooling does. Education, as defined by Bush. Education is a process that should make people more capable of manifesting who they are as defined by their cultural and community norms. So this is the work that education should do. And I believe it was, um, it was either Sheree or Lanisha who were saying that they would go to school and had to learn information for their schooling, but they would go home and research library, uh, research things in the library that gave them their education, that allowed them to manifest who they are as defined by their culture and their community, right? So again, this is the distinction that the author draws between schooling and education. This is the distinction that I also draw between schooling and education. Um, okay, so from here, Let's move into our fishbowl. Um, again, for the fishbowl, you could talk about my notes. You could talk about your journals. You could talk about your breakout room discussions. Um, Lanisha, are you volunteering for the fishbowl? Yeah. Okay. So we got Lanisha. Anyone else want to volunteer? Uh, Liz, Armani, and LJ. Okay, that will we'll be with those four. Liz, uh, Armani. Okay. Um, whoever wants to start it off is on you. Um, I started off. Okay. Um, I wanted to backtrack about what I believe it was uh, Marquisha and LJ when they mentioned like the um, their names and how difficult or how uh, one of the teachers um, or someone in his told him that his name was an Irish name. I grew up with, well, my name is Lanisha, and a lot of people mispronounced it, misspelled it, spelled the word one N, spelled the word an I. And um, I had a lot of teachers who were basically like, oh, can we shorten your name, call you Lynn, call you Nisha, or lie, or something like that. And I always used to say, oh, yeah, no problem, no problem, no problem. But then I had to also, like, how, how is it that you can get everybody's name right in this class, but not mine? So um, when I got into high school, I got tired like of people calling me oh Nisha or Miss Boyd. So I was like, either you learn my name or don't don't mention me. Like don't talk to me. Don't. And I didn't mean it in a disrespectful way, but like, how is it that you can say everybody's name in this classroom, give them the respect to say their names, but you cannot say my name perfectly? You want to call me a nickname? No, you're my teacher. Learn my name. And um, so I just wanted to say like I had that same experience that they did too. Thank you, Lanisha. Who's next? Uh, I, I can go next if it works for everybody. Um, so, so in our in in the, in the, the breakout group um, that I was in, um, we kind of talked about um, you know African American male theory being you know being kind of examined by the authors as a proper theory to explain you know the many uh, complexities experienced of the African American men and uh, boys in society. Um, it could because it highlights the different uh, complexities of being African American. So, um, you know, the idea that, you know, it's a lot of nuances, it's a lot of different uh, complexities, a lot of different things kind of happening. So, um, you know, they, they kind of present and submit, you know, uh, you know, the theory of uh, African, you know, African American theory, but they all but they're also, um, you know, the reasons to kind of explain how they're, they're also kind of resolved, right? Like, you know, this is what we present, but you know, if it's not adopted, that's fine too. And I, and to me, you know, that that was powerful in itself. Like, you know, this is what we present, but you know, they see a bigger picture, right? They, there's something more important than adopting this theory. Like, you know, cause things change and they're kind of fluid and progress, you know, as time move on, things are kind of different. And this, these are things we talked about in our meeting, in our uh, group. Uh, we, we also kind of talked about critical race theory and the critique of it as being a one way theory, right? It, it, it doesn't encompass enough of the of the African American male and boy uh, experience, uh, and then we, you know, one thing I kind of talked about that to me that was um, very very uh, like visually illustrative in the in the reading was the when they made reference to the juicer, right? They talked about the juicer, and then the orange, like the the the, you know, we were studying the juicer, 
when you, you need to be when, when the juicer is not something you really necessarily study it's the it's the it's the, it's the orange and that the juice that that you hope to kind of become the byproduct of the orange and, and and to me i'm like you know that was a very like great really illustrative example very unique different right because you don't really think about you know using a juicer <laughs> you know necessarily you know necessarily as a as a reference point but um it definitely kind of made sense in their argument you know and, and kind of identifying structures in place that kind of uh, create some of the conundrums and uh, problems that we have. Um, the last point I'll make is that um, the, for the, the namesake, right, Ameri African-American male theory, um, it also reminded me of uh, the theory of African-American offending. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a professor, but uh, I, when I, in, in research, in a research class I was doing, um, I came across this theory uh, by Sean Gabadin. It's called the theory of African-American offending. Uh, which states that African Americans offending are are breaking laws. And for those you don't, for the, for for lack of a better term, is grounded in the real conditions of what it means to be black living in a racially stratified society. You know, there is also other glaring racial disparities in offending that is centered on African Americans, and it is clearly related to our unique history and present racial uh, subordination. So, you know, again. Uh, uh, and, and this just similar to the African American male theory. This theory kind of presents like, you know, thinking of ways that, you know, African Americans have been kind of, you know, placed in some and in, in put in situations uh, to offend. You know, you look at the the racial look across this nation, you look across the country, and how racially stratified, you know, unfortunately, black people are. You know, and and, and a lot of times in these in these communities that we live in, you know, lack of resources, uh, over policing. Uh, racism, these are all things that's going to lead to, you know, folks being labeled or being even targeted for offending. So uh, just some of the takeaways from this uh, this week's reading. Thank you, OJ. Um, but we talked in my um, breakout room was um, the jail system, where it also like pretty much holds up a majority of black and brown um, men. And that's also why like they can't they, I guess, take out of like what man is really for or like what they are, um, what they are just because this system is pretty much keeping them away from their powers, their, um, their ability to do so much more than just be another number in, in this um, cycle of crime. Thank you, Liz. Um, our money's on you. Um, I want to touch back to the statement when you said um, we don't see color. A lot of white people tend to say that I see it on TV. And a long time ago when I was working at this company, I remember this older lady. Um, she was a client of mine's, and she was like, oh, you speak really well. I was like, oh, you know, that's really offensive. I told her, I was like, that's an offensive statement. She's like, no, it's not. And I was like, how are you going to tell me a person of color that it's not offensive? Like, you're pretty much trying to categorize me in a box. And you're like, since you're not, a, you don't hang out with other black people and you see on media what, you know, whatever she thinks about black people. And I just thought it was crazy because at the end she was like, well, I don't see color. Are you calling me a racist? I was like, no, but you cannot just say you speak well because you would never say that to another individual who's not of color. Um, and I just thought that was pretty much interesting because a lot of people who do state that they don't see color, they really find, they think that's their way of not being racist. And it's just a term that they use without even thinking or educating themselves. And, and like, let's unpack this idea of you speak well. Um, what she's really saying is you speak white. That's really what that means to take the code out of that, right? And, and in other words, anything that does not sound white is not acceptable, right? And, and also this idea of not seeing color is to not see the, really not to see you, right? And, and, and I'm training, and implicitly what that means is I've trained my eye only to see white, right? Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's pretty, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy the way they, I don't like to say they, her as an individual and the majority think, because um, not all people, all white people are like that. But I just found that really interesting. And, and I think for me, Armani, right, like the way that I try to make these distinctions, right, there's the idea of whiteness, right? Because idea, because whiteness is, is, is a concept, is, is an ideology, 
right? It's the idea of whiteness. And then there's the people who occupy white bodies, right? Because there's black people who adopt these ideals of whiteness, right? Yeah. And then there's white people who do not ascribe to these ideas and attitudes of whiteness. So for me, that's a great way to make the distinction. You don't have to go through the process and say, well, not all white people, but this idea and this notion of whiteness that, that has a, um, a, a hierarchical classification is what we're always critiquing and we're always poking holes at and we're always trying to dismantle, which is separate from the people who occupy white bodies. Right. Correct. Yeah. All right. Um, other, we have a few more minutes left. Um, I would like to hear from someone who has not spoke in regards to what their thoughts are on the reading. And, and, and I also, with the time left, is that we um, we didn't get to the the tenets of the um, of the theory. So what we'll do next week is we'll start off with those tenets real briefly, and then we'll go into whatever our next material is. But someone who has not spoke, please let's close this out. Um, I kind of wanted to just go over, I'm, and maybe we'll do this in the next class, but like what everyone thought about the resilience theory a little bit more in depth. If anybody has like some really good um, things to share, we kind of talked about it in our group a little bit, um, but I feel like I wasn't able to really grasp it as much as I'd like to. Um, so let me hear what you think about the resilience theory, Alexandra, and then I'll chime in and anyone else can chime in also. Yeah, so I know that it's, um, the theory is that it's like, um, African-American men and boys have that innate desire for self-determination. Um, and then it's like, uh, I think, unlimited capacity for intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to know more about like where this theory comes from. Not that I'm like um, arguing it, but I feel like a lot of it would come from like traditional African, um, you know, traditionalism that we learned at the beginning of the semester. But I don't know if that's wrong. No, you're, you're right. That's, that's where a lot of, so, and, and another thing too, um, that's part of the critique that they have with um, critical race theory is not allowing for this innate brilliance to come through, right? And, and the author is able to situate that innate brilliance by the research and the work that he does on African men prior to colonial experiences. So you're, you're absolutely, absolutely right in that. Um, but also the idea of the resilience and the um, resistance of African people stems from this theory that's called resilience theory. This is an actual um, theory that's that's out there, right? Um, so they're taking this idea and this notion of resilience and building upon that and, and, and being attentive to the fact that this resilience that becomes a whole theory, an academic circle, is present in African people regardless of how they interact with systems of power. Right. So it's not only their research that they've done on pre-colonial West African men is building on the theory that is resilience theory. And then just the overall interaction that they have with, you know, the black men they come in contact with throughout their lives. Does that more, more so answer your question? Yeah, that helps. I wasn't sure like where resilience theory came from or if that was a new concept because I hadn't heard that before. So. Yeah, it's um, it's not new. Because I, and I think this this article was written in the early 2000s. So right. resilience theory, I believe, come is more in the late 90s that that becomes more popular. But they're definitely building on and, and, and adding on to that theory, just like they're building and adding on to like ecological systems theory. Right. OK, thank you. That helps. It was a great question, though. Great question. Um, so let me show y'all what the reading is for next week, since we're right at, at, at 2.50. Um, give me one second, let me get that pulled up. I think it's this one. Let me just double check. Give me one second, y'all. So for next week, it's the article by the same author, um, Am I a Man? So Am I a Man will be discussed next week. And I'll email that out to you all by Thursday, um, no later than Friday. But if you don't want to wait, you can hop on the article right now or whenever it's convenient for you. Am I a Man? Is there any last minute questions, comments, or concerns?
Ooh, um, just looking at Nicholas in the chat. <laughs> what do I think about Dr. Umar? Ooh, that's a whole 